Go now to DryerBuzz.com and follow at DryerBuzz on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I tell you, and I do thank you for those that are watching the replay and those that are clicking the like and the share button. This particular stream, and I stream a lot, I'm live a lot, this particular stream is called This Ain't That Book Club, and it's called This Ain't That Book Club because there's a whole lot more. I did have an opportunity uh, on this week, and I know for those of you who do love watching This Ain't That Book Club, um, you normally see us in the bookstore, and we're not in the bookstore this week because we had a chance, had an amazing chance to go out uh, to a book talk this week, and um, Patrice Khan Cullen, Colors. I, I didn't catch how she pronounced her last name. She was in Atlanta on her book tour. And she is one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. Now, I did go live, uh, and that's one of the things on Periscope. You go to my profile as well as on my stream on Facebook. You can actually walk, watch a part of that conversation. It was We were invited out by Rose Scott, who is one of the hosts of A Closer Look, which also airs today at 1 o'clock on WABE Radio, where I am a social media contributor, uh, where I talk about all these social media trends and how people get bamboozled. So, and it's so funny, Facebook. Um, so, um, those of you guys that are coming back in, thank you so much. And we're going to try and keep continue this. And so, Patrice was uh, in Atlanta, and she's hitting up a number of cities. So, if you... Uh, Check out some of the book events in your city, or if you go on their Facebook page for the book, you will get a chance to see some of the dates and places that they are. So I had a chance to go out, and I did. They they were they welcomed the live stream for the Saint Death Book Club, and so we live streamed um, the Q and A, and then we got our book signed, which I'm excited about that as well. We did get our book signed, uh, and let's see, and it is signed too. This ain't that book club. So we got our book uh, signed for that. And, and I'm going to tell you again, uh, normally on This Ain't That Book Club, on Wednesdays, we go into the bookstore, we go down the book aisle, we check out the new releases, we check out books that have been recommended by some of our readers, and we check out those books, and we literally do a live e excerpt right there in the bookstore. If we like the writer's writing and style, writing and speaking style, um, we may bring the book home. We then take, bring the book home. We do a live stream. We kind of experiment, um, experience the book, and then the book goes into the book basket. From being in the book basket, we then hang around with it, keep it, um, go back to it every now and then, and we read a little bit of it. I do a couple little more, few more readings, and I place those on YouTube and so forth. Um, and then we move on to the next book. And one of the reasons why we call it the Saint That Book Club, because we may not read it from cover to cover. Uh, or we may not read it all in one sitting, as some of the diehard book clubs do. We love books that read like blogs. We love books that we need something, need a little bite of something today. We can go to the basket and grab that. I'm going to tell you. Uh, this one, it says, and this one has the forward by Angela Davis. And interesting enough, a lot of times people think things happen overnight. A lot of times people try to figure out how a person uh, started to do what it is that they do. Why would this? Why is this person driven? Well, come to find out in her talk that as a youth, she uh, has always been a stakeholder in her community, always wanted to have an impact on change. Because a lot of times we see people or we meet them or we encounter them at times when they've gotten some notoriety or some celebrity status or or curated their following, and we don't realize what it takes for them to get out of your recliner, get off your couch, get off your live stream, uh, get off your social media, and go out there and be engaged in their community. So anybody meeting her and, and learning about her at this point forward will always look at her in that light. You won't look at her as somebody who was just watching something on her social media just as you are, but she decided to take it a little bit further. And and it wasn't all glitz and glam. I mean, she's been they've been designated terrorists, right? Even though they're nonviolent, even though they're nothing like the KKK, even though they're nothing like countries that are coming against us, even though they're nothing like anybody that supports Donald Trump, uh, they have been designated terrorists. Okay? And we know that the country has a very hard time calling a real terrorist a terrorist. Uh, so, and we know even the terrorists have done much less damage in America than most of the people that live here. 
Uh, but anyway, so um, you get what we normally do at this end of the book club. It, the book is uh, $24.99, $32 for y'all in Canada. No wonder y'all got free health care and all that other good stuff. Uh, a poetic and powerful memoir about what it means to be a black woman in America. See how she had to put some poetry on now? A poetic and powerful memoir about what it means to be a black woman in America and the founding of a movement that demands restorative justice for all in the land of the free. Thank you so much, you guys, coming back in on Facebook. I hope Facebook has been a little bit more fairer to you guys in this one. Raised by a single mother in an impoverished neighborhood in Los Angeles, Patrice Con Cullors experienced firsthand the prejudice and persecution Black Americans endure at the hands of law enforcement. For Patrice, the most vulnerable people in the country are black people, deliberately and ruthlessly targeted by a criminal justice system serving a white privileged agenda. Black people are subjected to unjustified racial profiling and police brutality. In 2013, when Trayvon Martin's killer went free, Patrice's outrage led her to co-found Black Lives Matter with Alicia Garza and Opal Tometi. Condemned as terrorists and as a threat to America, these loving women founded a hashtag that birthed the movement to demand accountability from the authorities who continually turn a blind eye to the injustices afflicted upon people of black and brown skin. Champion human rights in the face of violent racism, Patrice is a survivor. She transforms her personal pain into political power, giving voice to a people suffering inequality and a movement fueled by her strength and love to tell the country and the world that black lives matter. When they call you a terrorist, it's Patrice Kahn Colors and, and Asia Bendeli's reflection on humanity. In its, it, oh, it is an empowering account of survival strength and resilience and a call to action to change the culture that declares innocent black life expendable. Black lives matter. So I just read to you basically what's right here on the jacket. And you got to know, we just, we discovered this in the bookstore. We were definitely going to bring it home. Luckily, we had an opportunity to um, meet the author and, and, and witness a, a amazing Q&A of talking about this and it's it it's mindful to me because um one of the questions that they ask is why is it that every generation has to have their own form of rising up if we've had the civil rights movement and the black panther movement and all these other movements and, and in my day like this in their day was trayvon martin in my day it was rodney king it was rodney king uh, me writing a letter to the editor that I realized, okay, they're probably not going to publish this. Let me publish this letter myself that I begin to become media um, for my community, that I began to, that, that grew into me blogging because I took that letter to the editor that I was writing about my own outrage after the Rodney King situation, published it in my community, and then I started writing other stories. The people said, well, can you, can you disseminate this information and disseminate that information until I started a distribution company, and it was called it Sistribution. So that's why I understand the Monique situation so well, is because I understand distribution. And what y'all need to understand is Netflix is very simply a distribution company. Okay, I know you just hit that button and you don't want to look away and that's your bay and y'all watch it and all this kind of stuff. But Netflix is a distribution company. So the first question you need to ask yourself before telling Monique to humble herself and before shout out the fact that they paid Dave Chappelle them a lot of money is you need to understand why is it that these, these top black folk still have to go to Netflix for distribution. Why don't they have their own? It will, it's, what will it take for them? And, and, and they do have their own. It's just that black audiences don't give a damn they have their own. Okay? Um, what, but but my, never mind those who have distributions out there trying to attract these people who will go to these places and do stuff for free but won't do it with their own for, for even a little bit of money. Um... Why why can't they go out there and dis distribute their own stuff? I don't understand that because it's about that upfront check. Because I've talked to one of the top black uh, filmmakers today and I asked, 
in the early days when they were big in Hollywood, I'm like, well, why don't y'all go to, why don't y'all distribute it in other forms of fashion? You know, they say we got a church on every corner. All you got to do is put a movie screen up in there and let the churches make money and the community make money. I mean, you talk about a movie theater, it only seats a couple of hundred people. You know, I mean, but see, you can try and break that down. But what they know about black audiences is that black audiences, they love being on the consumer end. Nobody wants to be on the investor end. And it, it boiled down to nobody wants to, and Prince even said that himself, is like, this is why artists are drawn to these, signing these bad deals because that's how they get the money in the first place to do their project. And so that's why when you say to people support black businesses, why we can't, because there's no money in the beginning. Okay. We've got to get to a point where there's money in the beginning. You know, don't just wait to buy it. People say, I want to buy the t-shirt. Okay, well, come and help me start. Get it, invest in the t-shirt company. I am very familiar with the business plan. Title is another example of distribution just for music. Master P talked about how he built his business by distributing his own. And you hear him say, you know, I sold music on the back of my trunk. That's distribution. Every time you stop somewhere and open your, your uh, trunk, those are called stops. I remember when I started distributions, uh, a guy called me and he said, well, how many stops do you have? And I was like, hold on for me just a moment. I went to Google because I was learning about distribution. All I knew is I had worked around logistics for a minute. And I knew that what I was going to do with my, with blogging, with, with building a media and a publishing company, um, it would be about distributing, right? Distribution. No, no matter who you are. If you're going to sell anything, you're going to, you will need a, a channel of distribution. And I said, well, let me get in on this very early on. As, and the guy called out of the blue because, you know, was nobody out there have, speaking in the language that I was speaking as it related to media. Because when I started Dryer Buzz, my goal was to have a nice, glossy, small, glossy magazine, very much like a jet magazine. In fact, I did studied and did research on everything that Johnson did in founding Ebony and Jet. Because that's what I had in mind for Dryer Buzz. But then I realized it's this whole lot of barbershops and salons out there. That's a lot of distribution trying to get a magazine into the salons and the barbershop. And I wanted to go to the salon and the barbershop route because the shelf life was amazing. But then, lo and behold, here comes the internet. I'm like, well, Yolanda, you know the internet. You know how to make websites. You know how to uh, start. And I literally start a, started a, a, a Netflix uh, back in the day. And some of the filmmakers that I distribute, you go to my website and watch these films. We would do live film streams. And, and the first one I did, we had like two, 3,000 people sitting there watching the film. That filmmaker called me yesterday morning. That particular filmmaker called me yesterday morning. Listen, I got to do something in Atlanta. You still got this? You still do that? I was like, yes. Can you do this? Can you do that? Can we roll in 45 days? Yes. Right? Because of the reputation. But now y'all saying that what Monique has done in the past don't matter. But what he remembered was when he was ready to release a film and other channels were not available to him, the one person he could come to was me. He he had my number saved, and I'm mad I didn't have his number saved. I'm like, damn, who is this calling me? I'm asleep, you know. And I asked him, hello. He's like, what's wrong with you? What's in your throat? Sleep. It's a frog in my throat. I'm asleep. He's like, listen, got to do a film. Got to roll in 45 days. I need you to be in it. I need you to help do this and that. You still do this? You still do that? I'm like, yes. He said, well, I said, but you said 45 days. Can I go back to sleep? Because you know, you can come to me in five minutes, and I can get you buzzing. So now you tell me I got 45 days. I can go sleep a couple more hours. Because, you know, I'm, I'm ready when you are, right? And so forth. And guys, let me watch this time. 11.30. we got to be out of here at 12 o'clock. So when you talk about this stuff, you've got to understand it's bigger than what it is when it gets to you as a consumer. What Monique needs right now, what everybody needs right now, is for the audience and their mindset to get out of the way. All you want to do, all you know, is that within that fee that you pay to Netflix, a couple of pennies of it is put in a budget that's offered to comedy, okay? And of that, of the $8 billion, so you only paying 9 10 15 or you using your grandmama's login, as y'all even out there saying, um, of the $8 billion that Netflix has said that they're going to spend on content, a portion of that is designated for the comedy, for the comedies, right? 
And then a portion of that is designated for the comedy that's there to entertain white males. And then a smaller portion of that is for the comedy that's in it, that's designated for the entertainment of everybody else. All the other different niches that are there. Then go come on down to the black female comedy. Uh, which black females have got to realize, stop trying to just talk to black women. Stop trying to just talk. Hell, I'm talking to black men. My audience is 54% black males and, what, 46% black women. Because black women, whom we know, uh, is a very odd and strange audience to have. Because black women will be in your audience not because they want you, they want to enjoy your content. They want to do what you do. And you have to know that and you have to understand that. Like Patty, Patty LaBelle came out with a sweet potato pie. Black women were like, well, hell, I, I ain't buying no pie. I'm going to make a pie. Right? That's why they didn't put out any commercials on Patty. That's why that dude was singing like Patty and not a woman. Okay? Homeboy, that was a man. Okay? That was a gay male. Saying Patty, okay, hell, y'all, y'all told Patty to give him more money than Netflix offered Monique. Y'all were like, he need to, Patty LaBelle need to break him off. Y'all didn't say Walmart need to break him off because see, Patty had already got her check. All right, she sold the recipe, the name, and y'all put, y'all put the name and the picture on the box. Patty ain't making no pies. Patty don't give a damn if you buying the pie. She got her check, okay, and she gonna get her residual. So, when you go in there, you paying Walmart, okay? But y'all was mad at Patty LaBelle, telling Patty LaBelle she need to pay. Y'all tell Patty LaBelle had needed to give him millions of dollars. But then y'all want Monique to humbly take half a million. Okay? Same thing when Oprah did her deal. When Oprah did her cable deal, I think Oprah wanted 10 cent, uh, per, 10 cent of every subscriber. See, I, nobody ever thought about it like that, right? When, when, when she came out with her network, the deal was, I think it was 35 cents. She was trying to get 35 cents. And I think they made me negotiate 10 cents. There's some numbers. It's come down to numbers and all that kind of stuff out there. Hey, uh, Laureen. Hey, Yate. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, these are the numbers. That this is the conversation you will have because this ain't that book club. If you can get the audience out the way, yeah, we understand. As an audience, you don't care what Netflix is paying anybody. You just want to make sure that your subscription went through this month or whomever subscription you're using. Because I'm sure when this subscription don't go through, because I know even my subscription have to try a couple of times. I'm like, damn, I forgot to change my card number. Hell, I just got a new card. I got to go out there all day long change my card number, but I. Canceled my Netflix. You check my Instagram. I canceled my Netflix. And I'm still mad y'all didn't tell me to watch uh, Cat Williams before I canceled my Netflix. So now I'm going to have to wait or use other means. <laughs> and the sad part is people are telling me what are the means I can watch Kevin, Kevin, Ke not Kevin, uh, Cat Williams. I'm like, don't be telling me to bootleg Cat Williams. That's my future ex husband that I'm still trying to save up money to buy him out, bail him out of jail when we get married. But anyway. It's, 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 it's business. Don't tell me it's business, not personal. It ain't even business. It's just math. It's just math. And Monique went out there and gave the math on the bankability when she said about her, her, her $47 million movie uh, made $25 million, whereas the other comedian, female comedian's $45 million only made $3 million. So that's bankability, right? But then, then people said, well, anyway, she still said, you know, it's like after she done said all this other stuff, after they done told you what it really is, okay, see, nobody wants to spend any kind of time on doing a deep dive on, on Netflix, but they doing that deep dive on Monique. It was like, well, anyway, she need to humble herself, and she said this, that, and the other. It's like, keep on. Go continue on, because all you're doing is hurting the relationship between, between you and I. Monique ain't think Monique is unbothered. Did y'all see her brush her shoulders off and walk out down stage to her sold out audience? Okay. But anyway, this ain't that book club. When they call you a terrorist, um, inside the book, next thing we do is we open up just to a random page. Um, before I open to a random page, I want to go through the table of contents. We look a little bit at the dedication. This ain't that book club. And I, I don't know what other book clubs do because I, I haven't really been in one. Uh, we look at the table of contents because what we're looking for in the table of content, and you guys can see it because down here, because if I hold it up to you guys, it's backwards, but Facebook is it's on the right way. Um, in Periscope, I think it'll flip around after that. 
we look at the table of contents, and the forward is, of course, by Angela Davis. We got to read that. You got to read some words by Angela Davis. Then it breaks it down into a part one, a part two, uh, a part one and a part two. Uh, part one, all the bones we could find. Part two is about the whole Black Lives Matter. In part one, it gives us the introduction. We are stardust. Uh, and that kind of tells you how, basically, how small we are on the planet and how we really should work together. Community Interrupted, 12 Bloodlines, Magnitude and Bond, Witness, Out in the World, All the Bones We Could Find, and then Part 2, Black Lives Matter, uh, Zero Dark Thirty, The Remix, No Ordinary Love, Dignity and Power Now, uh, Black Lives Matter, Rage, A Call, A Response, Hashtag Say Her Name, Black Futures, when they call you a terrorist. And it looks like about maybe 255, 255 pages. Um, here is the back jacket. Those are the ladies on the back jacket. And it's the perfect size book to just drop in your in your purse, uh, in your book bag. And, and for those of y'all don't like to read in public, you can, of course, you know, remove your cover. You don't want anybody to know what you're reading because... You know, still say Black Lives Matter right there because you're intimidated by your surroundings and your surroundings are so, uh, intimidated by you. You can do it that way as well. And, of course, there's a baby with all other versions out there online as well. Uh, I'm not canceling mine. Don't don't cancel yours. I don't give a god dying. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, out in the world. No, wait a minute. Uh, I've got to give a little bit of Angela Davis on this forward. Let's see if we. Oh, honey. And then there is uh, a quote of Santi Shakur. It is our duty to fight for our freedom, it is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. And that's Asanta Shakur. Uh, the Forward by Angela Davis. When I first met Patrice Con Colors, I could not have predicted. That within a short period of time, she, along with Alicia Garza and Oprah Tometi, would become the face of a movement that, under the rubric of Black Lives Matter, would rapidly reverberate throughout the world. And they talked about, in her talk you can watch on Periscope, they talked about how Black Lives Matter, as a hashtag and a movement, is being co-opted around the world. But I could clearly see that Patrice and her comrade, comrades were pushing black and left, including feminist and queer movements, to a new and more exciting level as they seriously wrestled with contradictions that had plagued these movements for many generations. In this memoir, Patrice generous, generously shares the intimacies of her life and loves and her unyielding devotion to the cause of freedom. The stories, and I'm going to pull it up just so people know I'm reading as they come in. The stories she tells here with Aisha Vandelli help us to understand why her approach to organizing and movement building has captured the imaginations of so many. Her story emphasizes the productive intersections of personal experiences and political resistance. A pivotal story of her brother's repeated encounters with violence-prone police officers, for example, permits us to better understand how state violence thrives at the intersection of race and disability. That Monte, Patrice's brother, is shot with rubber bullets and charged with terrorism as a routine police response to a manic episode reveals how readily the charge of terrorism is deployed within white supremacy institutions. We learn not only about the quoting nature of state violence, but also about how art and activism can transform such tragic confrontations into catalysts for greater collective consciousness and more effective resistance. When they call you a terrorist, thus illuminates a life deeply informed by race, class, gender, sexuality, disability, and religion at the same time as it highlights the art, poetry, and indeed also the struggles such a life can produce. 
But of course, it is not only Patrice's brother who is called a terrorist. It is Patrice herself and her co-workers and comrades, including Alicia, Opal, and the other organizers and activists affiliated with the Black Lives Matter network and movement whose commitments and achievements are in line with the label of terrorism. No white supremacist purveyor of violence has ever, to my knowledge, been la been lament lamented or labeled a terrorist by the state. Neither the slayers of Emmett Till nor the Ku Klux Klan bombers who extinguished the lives of Carol Robertson, Cynthia Wesley, Denise McNair, and Addie, Mac Addie Mae Collins before they could emerge from girlhood girlhood were ever charged with terrorism or officially preferred to as terrorists. But in, in the 1970s, President Richard Nixon instinctively hurled that label, that label at me. And in 2013, Asante Shakur was de designated by the FBI as one of the world's 10 most dangerous terrorists. There are many lessons to be gleaned from Patrice's memoir, not the least of which have to do with political rhetoric. The very title, When They Call You a Terrorist, asks the reader to engage critically with the rhetoric of terrorism, not only, for example, the way in which it has occasioned and justified a global surge of Islamophobia and how it has impeded throughout reflection on the continued occupation of Palestine, but also how this rhetoric attempts to discredit anti-racist movements in the United States. At the same time, racist, misogynist, and transphobic eruptions of violence continue to be normalized. The seemingly simple phrase, Black Lives Matter, has disrupted undisputed assumptions about logic of equality, justice, and human freedom in the United States and all over the world. It has encouraged us to question the capacity of logic, Western logic, to undo forces of history, especially the history of colonialism, colonialism and slavery. The logic expresses itself through our philosophical certainties and ideologies, presuppositions, and in our legal. Uh oh, hold on. Uh, all right, Facebook, you're giving me all kind of hell over there. Um, our legal system, which, for example, allows for incarceration of disproportionate numbers of Black people, immigrants, and from the from global south and people of recent immigrant ancestry, justifying the structural racism of such practices with reference to due process and other ostensible legal guarantees of equality. Patrice Kahn Cullors and her comrades within the movement of Black Lives, which embraces many more organizations, including the Black Youth Project 100 and the Dream Defenders of, in, of, in Florida, are helping to produce forward-looking movement approaches that represent the best possibilities for the future of our planet. They call for an inclusiveness that does not sacrifice particularity. They recognize the universal freedom in is an ideal best represented not by those who are already at the pinnacle of racial, gender, and class hierarchies, but rather by those whose lives are most defined by conditions of unfreedom and by ongoing struggles to extricate themselves from those conditions. This recognition and the vast power of love are at the core of Patricia's powerful memoir. That is a forward, guys, written by Angela Davis. Thanks so much, Will Williams and Ken, uh, for coming in. Um, and again, this ain't that book club. We don't read the book from uh, front to back. We don't read the book all in one study. We basically come on here on the Wednesdays and just let you know what our weekly read is. Uh, we always say for every occasion, buy a book. It's somebody's birthday today. Buy them a book. Take them out. Now you're going to take them out to dinner, buy them a drink, especially drink some whiskey, some liquor. I don't know what you're going to do. But also get them a book. For every occasion, we ask you to buy a kid a basket of books. They Tooth coming out, about to play Tooth Fairy. Put a book under the pillow. Put a dollar, whatever you're going to put up on that too. But put a book under there. You take a kid in the store, and the kid doesn't want to rush over to the book section, you're doing something wrong. 
Okay, they should want to go to the book section. And the great thing about the book sections today is any kid can walk down the book section and see uh, representations of themselves. That's the world that we live in, but there's a duplicity to the world that we live in because there's still constructs out there. America was built on the race construct, and America works each and every day very hard, each and every day, assisted by all ethnic groups, okay, uh, to keep that construct out there. We're all... In some form or fashion, those of you that are siding against Monique, you are hashtag covering. You are participating in the hidden assault on our civil rights, on our freedoms, okay? Believe it or not, because you refuse to exercise with your dollar. And Monique will probably get a point point zero 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 0.0005% of the money that you probably will spend on Netflix and you refuse to even you said to Netflix that we're gonna give you a hundred billion dollars and you better not give not nam dime of that to this woman. Netflix has said to you we're gonna spend eight billion dollars on content and we refuse to put any kind of value on it for black women. And then you go, well wait, they're giving they're gonna give Shonda Rhimes. Well hell it then took Shonda Rhimes twenty years to get to where she is, because y'all didn't want to support Shonda Rhimes when she had one show out there. You didn't want to support Shonda Rhimes when she was building Shonda Land. But now, because it's, she's trending, because she found uh, two black women I wish to put in the two shows that I don't even too much care about myself. Um, you know, it's like, it's sad. It's sad, you know, and, and you, when you look at what they've had to do with Scandal, you know, Scandal, when it first came on, it was a show about a powerful woman in D.C., and she was keeping D.C., and the next season, the damn man was raping her in the closet, and I'm like, I'm supposed to applaud? That ain't attraction. That ain't the same kind of affection. That ain't the, the hidden, you know, it's... I couldn't even explain it. I'm sitting there waiting for the season to come out. And you, you know, so you can tell I stopped watching in the second season. First of all, I was offended by the fact that they didn't even purchase an entire season. That they had to keep stopping and go make some more and make some more. It's like they didn't even get, they didn't even buy two, three seasons at a time. They bought two, three episodes. I'm like, that ain't right. Okay. And then on top of that, she, they, they were paid the least amount of money in television. I'm like, that ain't right. You know, there's so much things you can say, that ain't right. But people say, well, well, at least they're on TV. Well, hell, there's a lot of stuff on TV. And there's a lot of folk working for free on TV, right? And then that's apparently what I want Monique to do now because you're asking her to give her product to Netflix for free. Uh, Dishes done now, I can comment. Great scope, even without watching, listening was even more powerful. I know, listening, that's why I love doing audio. Uh, let me keep my eye on the time because I do need to get on the road. I am going to go and do radio. I, and this and people people said there's no way um, a blogger can talk that freely or somebody can talk that freely. But I talk just freely in my streets and I get invited to go do radio. So don't tell me you can't live by your convictions, okay? Um, so then the next thing we do with This Ain't That Book Club, after we've read the forward, read the jacket, read the table of contents, we open up. Because now we don't know yet what the voice of the writer sounds like. We don't know how the story reads. Now, I didn't meet the author, and I love the way she talked, but is that the same way she writes? I love the passion when she's on the protest field and she's at the podium and behind the mic, but is that is the same way in which she writes? So then the next thing we do, because This Ain't That Book Club, we open up to a random page random page and we just start we just start reading uh monte shifts and begin playing with the cell phone we bought him the world has turned over several times since 2006 we stop for a bite along the way and are thrilled to watch monte scarf down chicken steak pinto beans right and rice when we get into the valley alton asks the elder hey where should i take you but the old man has no plan that much is clear. He is reflective with so many prisoners who are coming home after lengthy sentences. They come home to a world they don't know, to a people who don't know them. Now, I know as I read this, there is uh, one of my Facebook friends. Her brother was just released. It's probably months into his release after serving, uh, I think it was six years uh, for a crime he did not commit, wrongfully convicted. He had a seizure while driving, 
and was convicted of vehicle homicide because when he came out of his seizure, he realized he had had an accident. He then went to check and see had he hurt anyone. And unfortunately, in having his seizure, he hit a policeman who was um, given a ticket on the side of the road. Unfortunately, that policeman died. And he was he was uh, charged with vehicle homicide, uh, and then finally uh, they tried to get it overturned. Now, mind you, his father himself was a policeman. Uh, of course, he had a two parent household, you know. Because I know how y'all like to like deep dive, like okay, yeah, he had a seizure, but he still he shouldn't have been driving. Y'all go to that part, uh, you know, and, and say yeah, he did, you know he 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 was he had seizure. A lot of people out there got epilepsy and they still drive. Right, driving right alongside you, right? But you causing more accidents because you on your phone, right? Um, so those are some of the things. So now that I read this, I know it resonates. It's gonna everything's gonna resonate. Hey, Alexis K. Tyler, let me talk about Alexis K. Tyler was one of the, the first y'all to master all this medium uh in building and mastering her audience. But I forget, like Monique, y'all don't care what people have done in the past. But when you jump online and you're talking to an audience, you live streaming, you're doing it because that sister right there set the trend. Okay, And I know y'all don't care about that, but I'm just saying. Alexis K. Tyler, she set the trend. She, she did first, 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 first. She set the trend. Okay. All right. And I know y'all like, y'all like me see a headline of somebody doing, becoming the first, right? Y'all like that part. But when you hear, when you hear a story or you see a headline, like, you know, homeboy won that first award the other night, the SAG awards, but you didn't think, wait, why, 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 why did we have an apartheid in the first place? Cause I mean, you know, black men have been, uh, lead the leads in a number of television shows, let alone movies. Why was he the first? See, I'm like, you mean he was the first? Yeah, sad was sad was, and it was that was, and we already had like the ninetieth Oscars, and in the seventy fifth, uh, it was the seventy fifth uh, uh, Golden uh, Golden Globes. That was the seventy fifth Golden Globes that they gave a black female comic the award for writing a comedy in seventy five years. Yeah, oh, okay, because it was oh, because it was an apartheid going on. Oh, that's right, I forgot there was an apartheid going on. So after seventy five years. Of having the award show, they finally awarded a black female comic. But you know these people don't like black female comics. They don't. They don't. They don't like black female comics. Even though that same black female comic, she got that top show over there on Netflix right now. Dude, don't, don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody that's. But don't tell nobody that's her show. Don't tell nobody. Don't tell. Don't tell nobody that's the same black female that was on now one. No, not now one one. On a, 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 a this is us. She was on this is us last night, and she played. And she was a woman at the uh, pound when the girl went in to get the dog. She was th that the black female. They probably just thought she was an extra. Yeah, they didn't realize that she was the same black woman that won the first uh, gold, first Golden Globe for comedy uh, after the apartheid. See, America don't realize they was an apartheid. I'm just, I'm just saying because they don't, they don't, they don't even stay and read the credits. They don't, they don't read the credits. They don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't look at the credits and, and, and see that that was the same woman. But see, they, they didn't cancel their Netflix, so they probably over there binging on the shy. But they didn't realize it was it's a, it's a project by a black woman because, you know, she, she can't tell nobody. She can't tell nobody. If she told some, oh, I just told somebody. I'm oh, sorry. Let me go back to reading. Okay. I'm just saying. They probably just thought she was an extra um, in that. And, and But think about it. But think about it. If they thought she was an extra... Cause she had that little scene in This Is Us. Cause she probably did that. Cause what she probably made off of that little scene in, cause you know it was a speaking role. So when you're an extra and you got a speaking role, you get a little check. So she probably used that money from being in This Is Us and probably about to go make a whole nother, make a whole nother, um, yeah, probably so. Because I think she got another deal. And then plus getting that globe after 75 years of apartheid, she probably somebody now. But they, they, they don't deal in that kind of stuff. No, we we won't we won't talk about that. Let's go back. Okay, let's go back to reading. All right, I'm just saying. Okay, they come home to a world they don't know to people who don't know them. I'm just gonna head down to Hollywood. He says, uh, we take him there, and I give him some some of the little money I have, and get back in the truck, and we head back home to my mother's new Section Eight apartment, complete with a small balcony. Where a barbecue is happening. Chase and Monty reunite awkwardly. Chase won't give his father a full embrace. He's in full-blown adolescence and perhaps 
that explains part of it, but most of it is about how you can never get back the time. He's not happy to see me, Monte whispers to me sadly. Yeah, he is, I respond. He just has to get used to things. We always got to get used to something. Uh, so we always got to get used to shit that happen every day. Uh, <laughs> I'm just saying. We go for a walk that night through the old neighborhood for a little while. Oh, I forgot all those other people that watch uh, This Is Us. Yeah, now they know that the black woman that with the extra who had the speaking part, that she has her own show on Netflix. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that. But anyway, okay. He said, like, okay, for a little while, uh, we go for a walk that night through the old neighborhood for a little while. We talk or don't. We laugh. We don't cry. We embrace the sense of relative calm. I kiss my mother, my brother. At the end of the night, call me in the morning. Mom, I say, and she promises she will. Monte walks me to the door. Can you help me find a job, Teresa? That's my name. Uh, I need to work, he says. He does not yet know that my team and I have already been planning something for him. There's a small social justice organization I've been working with. They will give Monte a job as a janitor. This is part of the re-entry plan. Get him this job, and between me and my tribe, we will ensure he makes it to work on time each day. Each of us takes a day. Things go smoothly for several weeks, and then they don't. Monte calls me and says, Therese, there's going. they're going to let me go. What? I can't believe it. These are friends. They haven't spoken to me. I call the executive director. She tells me Monte isn't cut out for the job. I explain how we likely have to adjust his dosage. This is what working with people who have a mental illness is like. She's not moved or sure enough. She lets Monte go. Monte is broken. He curls up on the couch in my mother's house for months and months and goes inside himself as my mother struggles to support him and chase and to a large degree Bernard whose work is spotty and it's Jasmine and Alton who have relocated to Las Vegas who get her to shift after a lifetime of Southern California my pious mother packs up and heads to Sin City they run us out of California. Sharice Alton says, come on to Vegas. People can live here, he says. Alton has opened a small mechanic shop, Seven Palms Automotive in Las Vegas, and Jasmine lets her mother know there are jobs and, ho and whole houses there can be rented for cheaper than apartments in LA. I accept this with my mother, is, that my mother is leaving, but I cannot help think that the drug war the drug on gangs, let me see, wait a minute. The drug war, the war on gangs has really been no more than a forced migration project. From my neighborhood in L.A. to the Bay Area to Brooklyn, black and brown people have been moved out as young white people build exciting new lives standing on the bones of ours. The drug war as ethnic cleansing. Monte and Chase relocate with my mom, but it doesn't last long. He tells me over the phone one night how much he hates it in Vegas. Has nothing that how nothing is familiar to him. He says he wants to come home. Don't do that, Monte, I say. Whatever mom is, you're home. Wherever mom is, you're home. I have no friends here, Trees. No one's left in Van Nuys, I say. They're all locked up, I say, or dead, I say. Monte pauses. Cynthia is there, he responds. And with that, we are right back where we started. It is 2012 now, and Monte has been home less than a year, and already he is in his third residence. Predictably, it's a disaster, and predictably also, I suppose, it is my mother again who has to share the hard news. Monte's off his medication, she says. He is breaking up everything in Cynthia's house. Right now, as we're speaking, she says, Trees, please get Paul and get over there. Mark Anthony and I are living about 45 minutes away from Van Nuys and in an artistic village in central Los L.A. called St. El St. Elmo's. We rush over to Cynthia's apartment, and as we do, we call Paul. Can you get right, can you, can you get right over? Paul can get there. 
faster than we can. It will be the first time he will see his baby brother like this. I call him to say we are near and Paul tries to answer. But the only thing that comes through is all the noise in the background. Y'all know, y'all know this story. Brother, brother, look at me. Paul is shouting. Monte is shouting too. But I cannot make out his words. But then I hear him begin to cry, which may be a good sign. Crying may exhaust him, may stop him. When we arrive, we step into the house, step into a house that's been destroyed. Furniture is turned over and some of it's been broken. Plates are smashed in the center of it all. My brother is, is my brother Paul is holding Monte in his arms, holding him like he held all of us when we were small. Paul is wiping the sweat from Monte's bald head and brow. Monte has calmed down, but Cynthia understandably has not. He can't stay here, she says desperately. I know, I say. I was I was on one, Huntress. Huh, Monte says, looking up at looking up at me from his brother's arms. In this moment, he looks like a small boy. I shake my head. You were, I say, without judgment or anger. I look in my brother's eyes. Monte clearly has hasn't slept, and getting him re getting him rest is a huge priority. But first, we have to get him out of there. I tell Paul and Mark Anthony, and I will take Monte home with us, which we do. And as we get him to at least lay down, we call the team together. Jason, Tanya, and my friend Damon. Mom rushes back into town. And with no success, we all try to convince Monte. He has to go back into the hospital. I'm writing this in sentences, but this unfolded over days. Over several really hard days, my team, my community, my tribe, they stay with us. There's an afternoon where mom presses Monte as much as she can. Please, baby, you have to go back to the hospital, she begs. But he associates doctors and hospitals with prison and four and five point restraints. He won't listen to us. I'm not going there again, he says, determined. We push more, but he refuses any pleas, especially from mom and me. He seems embarrassed around us. I think, I think he thinks he is supposed to protect us, not the other way around. But men have been most present at all in his episodes, even if he's been men in law, even if it's been men in law enforcement who hate him. He is used to male energy. Monte begins spiraling up. He's terrified. Someone I don't recall who gets him to take his Ativan for his anxiety, but it doesn't work. We're likely past the Ativan stage. Instead of calming down, Monte flashes back to his first time in county jail when he was beaten and starved. And before we can stop him, he is in the bathroom where he starts drinking from the toilet. A toilet during the during, a toilet during part of his time in LA County Jail was all he had to drink from. Monte is having a complete flashback, a PTSD induced flashback. And and perhaps because it is so terrible, so horrible Perhaps because in that moment we are all with Monte in the inner cage in LA County Jail. It's what does it for us, what steals our reserves. We, when will, no, we will get Monte to the hospital and get him the help he needs. Negotiations have to ratchet up. Mom, Paul, me, and Mark Anthony call in all the troops. Tremaine, our half-brother from another relationship, Alta had, Jason and Damon, Mark Anthony with his training and healing, and acupuncture serves as a negotiator. Monte, he begins, we have to get you to the hospital. Nope, Monte responds, Monte, I can explain why. Yep, can I explain why? Yep, because you're having PTSD, brother. We can't let you drink from the toilet. It's bad for you. You don't deserve that. Mark Anthony speaks slowly, his voice gentle as a new mother's embrace. Monte is quiet. We can't help you here the way we want to. We love you. We want you well. Monte is thinking. And then from Monte, a challenge. I'll go to the hospital if you give me 10 pull-ups in a row without stopping. Now Mark, now, Mark Anthony is tall, but he is super skinny. This is going to be hard as fuck. 
But he takes a deep breath and says, okay, Montaigne. And they head, oh, they head out to the pull-up bar we have in the yard. We all follow them and watch as Mark Anthony struggles. One pull-up, two, three pull-ups, four. And finally, finally, without breaking, he hits it. Ten. He drops breathing heavily. Monte won't go back on his word. A deal is a deal. And all the black men gathered there create a gentle healing circle around my brother Monte and guide him into Tremaine's car. My mom and I follow them. And in route, I call a nurse I know who works at County USC and tell her we're coming. She doesn't work in psychiatric admissions, but she is there and waiting to help guide us when our mini, mini caravan arrives. It takes Monte 30, maybe 40 minutes to get out of the car. We wait and slowly, slowly, I see Monte emerge from the car. He is walking gingerly, Paul on one side, Tremaine on the other. He has a towel over his head. They don't let my brother stumble. They don't let him fall. This is the image of black men that, lie, that lives in my head. This constructive care, this steady love. Mark Anthony walks ahead of them and speaks to the security and somehow penangles his way into the back and helps Monte through the intake and into his room where he gets the doctor to give my brother a shot so he can really and fully sleep. For the first time in three or four days, Mark Anthony, Tremaine, and Paul get back in the car and drive back to our bungalow. My mother and I get in my car and begin to talk about how to help Cynthia put her home together. We have navigated this situation with no police involvement. We have navigated, oh, no, at that, and that night before I drift off to sleep, laying next to Mark Anthony, I think this is what community control looks like. This is what the love of black men looks like. This is what our black yesterday once looked like. I think, and I think if we are to survive, this is what our future must look like. Wow. And going on, uh, that was chapter eight, and it was called, uh, and we just did a random read. Actually, we didn't read all of chapter eight. We opened to a random part, uh, but the next part is No, no Ordinary Love, and it's, it starts out, it's Spike Lee, who brings Mark Anthony and I together. Now, y'all know I love me so Spike Lee. Uh, I'm a year ahead of him singing in high school, and I'm obsessed with Spike Lee. That is my life, y'all. Uh, Spike Lee's joint bamboozled. A razor sharp satire that tells the story of a black man. Uh, he's a Harvard grad who is continuously humiliated and abused by his white boss at a television network. The white boss, who is married to a black woman, asserts that he's blacker than Delacroix, and repeatedly he calls Delacroix the N word. Uh, the white boss refuses to allow any of Delacroix's positive story ideas about black people go through. Okay, I'm, we're gonna stop. I gotta stop because that thing said twelve o'clock. A few minutes ago, let me just double check because we got to go. This ain't that book club, guys. I'm Yolanda. I'm Dryer Buzz, and this is where you binge on Buzz. Shout out to everybody that came in, Mark Davis, Erica. Shout out to all of you that have cycled through on Facebook and as well as on Periscope. Some version of, of this book club is going to end up over there on, on YouTube. This is the book uh, that we're reading. This is the book that's buzzing this week. And it is called uh, When They Call You a Terrorist Takes You Into the Life, the Life Before, During, and After. The movement that's called Black Lives Matter. And it tells you a little bit about how Patrice became a stakeholder in her community, walked outside and away from and utilize her social media. I won't say she walked away from. Utilize her social media uh, to help start and found what became the movement known as Black Lives Matter, a movement that is more than a hashtag and it is, and it's been co-opted all over the world throughout the diaspora, not just for black people, but the fact that for lives. And guess what? People who want to say all lives matter, all lives will matter when black lives matter. 
And so I read a little bit of the jacket. I read definitely the forward by Angela Davis. And then we did a random excerpt. We always do a random excerpt. This is the book that goes into the basket. You know, once we put a book in the basket, we then have to take a book out of the basket. Uh, the basket is not all that quite full. I'm not ready to take a book out of the basket. When the basket becomes full, we'll put one in and we'll take one out. I am the author of 27 Essence to Create Buzz. I tell you how to create buzz for your business. If you want to use social media for business, this is a piece of artwork up here. It's called The One With Ideas. I saw it. I had to buy it. It's by a student. I bought it at a student art show. Go out and, and become part of your community. Uh, I had a thought when I was reading that. Uh, here in Atlanta, there was a story on the news just today about a young woman who went into who went to Target at seven o'clock in the evening, and uh, and she walked out of the Target, and a guy decided he was going to just rob her right there in Target. She fought him, damn near probably whipped his ass. Um, but she has she she was had some bruises and things like that. He she said he repeatedly punched her, tried to take her bag. Uh, she fought back, but you know what the community's. Um, conversation with her was why was she alone how many times are you going to target by yourself at seven o'clock okay we gotta we gotta watch how we deep dive so if we deep diving we're deep diving as to why didn't she just give up the purse why is she going into the target by herself why is she why is she why is she uh sorry uh why is dude robbing people at 7 o'clock. Why is dude lurking in the parking lot? Why is he able to hang out? And, why is he able to make steps toward? Why in your community is anybody able to make steps towards a black woman? Okay. Why in your community is anybody able to conceive, sit on somebody's couch and conceive the idea that they're going to go out and rob black women? Okay, but we deep diving on to one. I mean, you might as well ask God, why is she black? Come on, why does why is she y'all y'all? This is what they're saying. Y'all got to stop going places by yourself. Well, kind we kind of been in this by ourselves a long time. Okay, but when when your mother, your sister, your daughter, your granddaughter, your aunt can't go to Target at seven o'clock in your city and in the best was quote unquote the best part of your city. What's quote unquote the best? Even though the best part of your city has some of the highest crime rates, she went to the. She decided not to go to the Target in the hood. She went to the Target in the best part of the city at seven o'clock and became assaulted. Now you're not gonna tell me that there were no seven o'clock. Ain't nobody. Ain't nobody in Target. Ain't time seven o'clock. Target is usually packed, right? The parking lot is usually full. So let me tell y'all something. Something happens to you, the only thing you're going to end up with, because you don't have any allies, clearly, Monique, you know, got, Monique found her tribe real quick, because y'all let her know, y'all are not allies to somebody who has done 30, 40 years of work, right? Um, I w I'm just embarrassed, and, and people ask me why I left. I, I went to my old neighborhood this weekend for the Women's March, and I stood out there with all these white women who came out to help get black women elected, women of color elected, and I realized I was standing in my old neighborhood, and people asked, well, why did you leave? Because a black woman, black women were being murdered, and the black men were saying, and I, I remember saying to someone I thought was a friend of mine, someone I thought who had, would have my back, and I told him, I said, you know, sister, sister got murdered over there. And, uh, and he says something about either, what did he, his, his response took my breath away. Uh, I said, can, can you believe people let that happen? Well, it's her fault. He said something to the fact that made it her fault. And I was like, I need not be in this community. I need not be in this neighborhood. Because I don't want you to just be on the news saying that something happened to me because I decided to live alone or I decided to go to the store by myself. I, I, One thing I am quickly learning about social media, and one thing I already knew about social media because I watched a documentary, We Live in Public, in, in 2000, that showed that this is where you were going to end up. Um, if some, and, and I know if something happens to me, um, that people are just going to say, well, you know, she said this on social media or she went to the store by seven o'clock in the, in the evening, a woman coming out of Target and is attacked, beaten. Okay. Now you got to understand this probably, this assault probably went on maybe what, five, 10 minutes. And the question is, why did she go to the store at seven o'clock by herself?
Erica Thomas, hello, darling. I'm just saying. And I and actually I, I saw Erica Thomas uh at the at the event. That can't be your question. The question <laughs> it was right here. What she just said they did for her brother. She called her team. She called her tribe. She didn't call the police. Because she knows what would have happened with the police because it had happened to him before. So they know that they couldn't call the police. Hell, I called the police. I called the police one time on somebody that was passing counterfeit money and the police came and harassed me. I'm like, okay. Print as much money as you want, people. <laughs> I mean, that's just that's just where we are. She she tells you in the book what has to be our future. What has to be our future? What has to become our future. This is our book of the week. Next week we'll be doing another book. Uh, if I see any more of the book events, I'll go to those. We definitely will live stream uh, or we'll be back in the bookstore looking for a book. This is the book you want to get. In whatever variation you get your books, whether you want to go get the audio, the audible, the ebook, uh, I like having the book. I like having the book. Again, this ain't that book club. We don't read the book from cover to cover. Uh, we just basically like something that we can open up and, and feed ourselves. We like books that read like blogs. We like books that are nonfiction. Um, we like me we love memoirs. Because this is got, what I love about this is it speaks to this new generation. People love to say millennials, but it speaks to this new generation. Um, for those that are asking how to really get people engaged. Uh, and do a little bit more than just social media. I mean, it started with them just using a hashtag. It started with them just using a hashtag. And they used the hashtag. And then everybody started using the hashtag. And then they said, maybe we ought to show up at something. Let's let's just let's show up. Then they said, well, maybe we ought to go to Ferguson. Then they just went to Ferguson. And then they went to other places and other places. And so now, uh, they've been all around the world. They've been to the White House. They sat down with the President. They sat down with Congress. Um, and, and so forth. They literally have set the tone. Okay, and you know what I love? What I love, 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 love that she said in her talk. You can watch the talk on Periscope. You can watch. Ten, I have ten minutes of the talk that she gave just recently here in Atlanta, and she's on a tour stop coming to your city. Uh, ten minutes are on Facebook. Ten minutes are on Periscope. She says, "Guess what? In twenty years, um, you're going to be celebrating Carl. You're not celebrating him today." In 20 years, you're going to be celebrating Colin Kaepernick, just like you're celebrating Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and all of them today. Their their journey is, is, is what I love about, if you're going to repeat history, repeat history this way. Allow history to keep creating great individuals. One day, we're going to be celebrating Patrice. And I love the way it's spelled, P-A-T-R-I-S-S-E. My Patrice is spelled P-A apostrophe because I come from that generation where our mothers put an apostrophe and everything. P-A apostrophe, T-R-I-C-E. Hers is P-A-T-R-I-S-S-E. I love that. That's the uniqueness. And, the, and you know what? The unique spelling of her name is what made her the person that she is today because we all know a bunch of P-A-T-R-I-C-E people, but... Look at the unique, the uniqueness and the spelling of her name. That's what gave her her character. That's what gave her her destiny. Her, when her mother said, I'm going to put two S's in there. That's what changed the dynamic of the person that she became or she was born into. She now has to live up to that uniqueness of, uniqueness of her name. Just like when my mother put an A in my name instead of an O, Yolanda, Y-A-L-A-N-D-A. -A, people call me Yolanda with an A. It changed up. My destiny, it changed up my destiny and, and put me on trajectory, it changed up my trajectory as Patrice uh, said it, said it uh, uh, on her event. All right, guys, listen, follow me. I'm going to cut it out. I'm going to stop streaming. I'm going to keep the book up. I'm going to stop streaming here. Here's my book. Here's her book. I'm going to stop streaming here, but I'm going to run right out of this door and into Atlanta. Tra no, I don't do traffic. Traffic is a transplant. I want to do a back row. And I'm headed over to the studios of Love 860. And I'm going to um, be a contributor on a show called Chandon's Corner. And Chandon, I'm no, I noticed Chandon, I didn't know if Chandon jumped on or not. Uh, Chandon air, Chandon's Corner airs Wednesday, 2 p.m. on Love 860. So put, put bring it up on your tune in. Uh, go to the website, download the app, love860.com. Uh, I'm a con contributor on there on Wednesdays. It airs at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and uh, I'm going to talk about what was blog breaking this week. 
And uh, so we're going to talk about it with an entirely different audience, but I invite you to, to join me in that audience. Uh, it's going to be an amazing day. And it's the fastest, most informative hour of radio that you will enjoy. And, and then, too, Chandy, you got to meet, if you don't have met Chandy yet, you got to meet Chandy. And he's, he's a great guy. And so I'm glad to be a contributor on his on his show. And, uh, and there are a couple other shows that I am contributing on it as well. So And I will go live. In fact, I think I will take, because I get tired of holding the phone. So I think I'm going to take the self, I'm going to take the uh, joystick. I use the joystick, which was an invention of a black woman. Uh, you guys are sitting on my joystick. I'm going to take my joystick with me today because uh, I want to, um, I was trying to think if I had the other thing, the other piece to it. I'm going to take the joystick so we can go full on and get, let you guys witness. Let you guys witness, watch radio at Channing's Corner uh, with me, contributor Yolanda Dryer Buzz. Again, swipe to my profile on Periscope. You can see other amazing content, including Watch the Talk on, on Periscope. Those of you on Facebook, go over to Periscope. I think literally the video previous to this one is the video of the talk that Patrice gave when she was in Atlanta. Uh, look for the book and look for uh, a visit to your city because she is on tour there as well. And then again, continue to filter the entire internet so that you can binge on Buzz and watch for us. We're going to do, we've got a t-shirt sale coming. The t-shirt is going to include a copy of my book, 27 Answers, and it's going to include, hopefully I get it finished, the new book, which is called 27 Answers to Begin Again, which is going to be followed up by the anthology of an amazing 27 stories of people who had to begin again. Sometimes we have to begin again. It just depends if you how you want to win. All right, I'm just trying to rhyme that. All right, guys, I love you all for watching. I love you all for sharing. Uh, and when I close this out, I'm going to see all the shares and all the comments and all the likes. And Facebook, if I didn't get a chance to really truly engage with you guys because I wanted to get that read in. And we were, we were uh, co-streaming as well. We were doing a dual broadcast. But I will come back into the comments as well. Uh, what else do we have going on? On Mondays, uh, we're looking to do something on Monday. On Tuesdays, I'm in the kitchen. We're doing Feeder Blogger. We're back doing Feeder Blogger. One of the books that I got for Christmas was Aisha Curry's cookbook. That smells good. What you got? Are you warming up? Uh oh, lunchtime. Lunchtime. Oh, I hope I didn't have you on my shop when you walk by there. I hope not either. <laughs> no, I don't think I did. I hope not. I hope not. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, looks like it's lunchtime. So I'm going to try and grab something before I head, head out to the studio. It smells good. Uh, I'm going to try and grab some lunch and, 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 and chill out with my daughter for a little bit before I head out. And there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Y'all, as an audience, listen, people, if you're, if you're just specifically in the audience, um, we're, 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 at a, we're at a time now where we just need you to think about things just a little bit more. Watch how you're doing your deep dive. Just think about things just a little bit more. Be a little bit more patient. Wait, you know, before you join the social mobs, going after everything and so forth. But again, thank you all so much. Uh, I see the love. I feel the love. And I'm going to keep on blogging. 16 years blogging. And we are in our sweet 16. So try not to do too much because our anniversary is coming up in March. Um, March the 13th. 16 years with Dryer Buzz. Go now and binge on Buzz with uh, hashtag Dryer Buzz. All right, going to end you guys here on Facebook. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much for the hearts. Uh, thank you so much for those of you that watch, that, those of you that are even just listening. Maybe you put us in. Let me see. Try to get that post. Maybe you, uh, Periscope, I love you guys. Oh, my God, I love you guys. Um. Thanks to those of you that are catching replay and, and, and some of you, even if you don't watch, that you listen. I try not to give you so much of a visual that you can't go on and do something else and just listen. But don't forget, follow me. I'm going, I'm going to go live again when I get to the radio station. Bye. You are a definitely a spiritually filled thinking woman. And that is what we've been lacking in our community. Go now to DryerBuzz.com and follow at DryerBuzz on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. It's all about the buzz. Yeah.